Lost Battles, pretty unique game. One of the reasons is that the game was preceded by and now comes with a book, a full book written by the designer of the game, Professor Philip Sabin, Professor of Strategic Studies at King's College, London. In this book, that also works as sort of like the designer's notes of the game, in this book, Professor Sabin explains how he created a general model to account for uh, ancient warfare to explain uh, the way in which the ancient battles worked as a whole. Then of course there are ways in which um, this general model is applied to specific battles in different periods and in different places with different types of army. But the idea was to create this general model. In order to do so, the uh, designer put together an impressive amount of scholarship. You can really see how many examples are given for everything in the book. And then it's not just a matter of quantity. These examples, these um, elements and facts from the sources have been put together in a really nice system of abstractions, meaning that yes, uh, things have been abstracted to be able to fit in the design, but they have been abstracted in extremely interesting ways, ways that just feel right. The design behind the entire design is to give you a realistic experience and you really have the sense that um, the, the mechanics have been adapted from reality and they really managed to mirror reality at an impressive level of accuracy. At the same time this sort of like apparently very abstract system in reality allows you to see things at the grand tactical level, the design goes past the most minute and vexed questions of how things went and it allows you to look at the big picture to see how the event of the battle as a whole went and it developed and it could have developed. Extremely interesting premises here, now let's see how the game plays. The game is played on a grid of 5 by 4 double sided terrain tiles. You also have more terrain tiles but in each game you will only use 20 and if you consider that these tiles are double sided you see that you really have a large number of different types of landscape that you can create with these tiles. Here set up the terrain for the second battle of Caronea. It doesn't have many terrain features because I wanted to keep things simple. Still you can see a hill here and a camp there. Also I've set up the game using the historical deployment. This scenario book will tell you where to place your units according to historical events. But you can also choose the, to play the game using the uh, free deployment option. In which case you will bring your units on the board in the way that you prefer. That of course gives you more options and it increases the replay value of the game But I haven't even started experimenting with free deployment I'm just having so much fun uh, trying the different types of historical battles that are available in the game each battle will have two key zones that will be indicated by these two markers on the board. There is a key zone belonging to each side. Each side is trying to keep control of its own key zone and to take control of the opponent's key zone. This is very important because key zones have a huge impact on the morale of the army that of course will force the players to work mainly around certain areas of the board and if this may be seen as a limitation on one hand, on the other hand it encourages the players to keep things in line with their historical development. A game lasts up to 10 turns or until a side has 3 or less units on the board. At that point the game is over and you count victory points based mainly on elimination of enemy units. You also take into account handicaps that are meant to make things more even for the side that started in disadvantage and at that point you determine the winner based on who has most victory points. Each turn is divided into player turns. The scenario instructions will tell you who goes first and who goes last in each turn. In some scenarios you may have a brilliant general that will be allowed to declare turn reversal once per game. That means that in a turn a side will go 
second and then if that side has the brilliant general and the brilliant general declares turn reversal that side will go first next turn and for the rest of the game that means that at that point the brilliant general will have had two player turns in a row which can be particularly powerful each side has a fighting value based on the number and quality of the troops in play. This side starts with 51, that side with 64. At the beginning of each turn, the active player receives an amount of commands equal to one tenth of the fighting value, 51, five commands. Those commands will be spent to execute actions on the board and to give attack bonuses to units in combat. The first time that you go down to zero one commands, you really die and you add the rolled amount to your command points. That means that towards the end of your turn, you may receive a considerable amount of commands or maybe not such a great amount of commands. The good thing is that you do not know the exact amount of commands that you're going to have at the beginning of your turn and that keeps things fresh and prevents the game from feeling too gamey. Units can be activated in several different ways. The most common one is the normal activation. In a normal activation, it costs one command point to activate a single non-veteran unit, a command point to activate two veteran units, and two command points to activate any other group of any size and any composition. Most cavalry units activated with a normal activation will receive two actions and all other units will receive one action. Those actions can be spent to move, attack or change facing. The advantage of cavalry having two actions is that cavalry can move and attack in the same turn simulating a charge whereas other units can either move or attack and that means that usually as they approach the enemy they will get to be attacked first before they get a chance to attack next turn. Another type of activation is the limited activation. It only costs one command point for a group of any size and units in that group receive the same amount of actions that they would receive in a normal activation. But those actions can only be used to change facing and if a unit has enough actions to attack. So in a limited activation units cannot leave the tile in which they started their turn and also if an attack is launched only the leading unit can attack, not all units in the group that has been activated. The third type of activation is the express activation which is meant for fast movement. It is an expensive type of activation because it only applies to individual units, never to groups. It costs a command to activate a single veteran unit with an express activation and two command points for any other individual unit. An express activation will give a unit double the actions that the unit would receive in a normal activation, but those actions can be used only for movement and facing changes. Leaders will be assigned to the players according to the scenario instructions. Leaders have different levels of quality and the level of quality of a leader is indicated by the color of the stripe on the leader's counter. Leaders will be able to issue free commands to the units in their tile, very convenient, and the number of free commands depends on the quality of the leader. Leaders will also be able to issue free attack bonuses. An attack bonus is a bonus of plus one during an attack. Usually that must be purchased and for most units it costs two commands to have a plus one when attacking. So that is a very expensive bonus and the fact that leaders can give free attack bonuses can really come in handy in many cases and can really make the difference. Leaders can also rally unit. A unit that took a hit in combat is flipped to its reduced side, to its spent side, and if that unit takes a second hit, the unit is eliminated unless a leader is present and decides to rally it. A leader that is trying to rally a unit rolls two dice and then depending on the quality of the leader, 
the result may indicate that the leader managed to rally that unit. In that case, the unit ignores the second hit and remains in play. Of course, the better the leader, the better the chances are that the rally attempt is successful. But also, each time that the leader exposes himself to danger to rally a unit, there is a chance that the leader will be wounded or killed in the process. And again, depending on the quality of the leader, the leader may be more or less likely to be wounded or killed in the process. To resolve combat, you cross-reference the type of unit that is attacking with the type of unit that is defending and you find the number to hit. Then you roll 2d6 and you take into account all the modifiers that apply. This is a quite long list of modifiers, but do not be scared. Sure, the first combat or two, it will be quite a procedure to go through all of these modifiers, but then you will learn what they are all about. It will become second nature, you will immediately be able to identify what are the ones that apply to each situation, and you will realize how much depth comes to the game from this list of modifiers because really finding ways to take advantage of as many of those modifiers as possible and try to prevent the opponent from using too many of those is one of the most crucial aspects of this design. Once you have the total uh, attack, the modified roll, you compare it with the number to hit and if the modified total is lower than the number to hit there is no effect, if it is equal to the number to hit, uh, you have no effect unless your fresh attacking unit becomes suspended to inflict a hit on your unit to inflict also a hit on the opponent. If it's plus one or plus two, you just deal a hit. If it is plus three, you inflict a hit and again you have the option of inflicting a hit on your fresh attacking unit to inflict an extra hit on the opponent. With four plus, you simply inflict two hits on the opponents. Whenever one of your units is eliminated or one of your generals is killed or wounded in combat, you have to check the morale of your army. You roll a die and you add several modifiers to obtain the general morale of the army. Then you will have to apply that number to each unit individually because each unit receives its own set of modifiers based on the position of the unit on the board, the quality of the unit, whether a unit is spent or fresh and there are other modifiers. And then each unit will receive one or three individual results. The unit may just stay and keep fighting, the unit may panic and leave, and then you have the third result which really is the coolest one, and that is that a unit stays on the board if everybody in its tile stays on the board if nobody panicked, and a unit leaves if somebody else in the tile panicked and has left. That can really create some spectacular domino effects where you, the leader, have the sense that your army is still there, physically they can do it, they're still holding ground, but then somebody freaks out and starts running, everybody freaks and in a second everybody's running and you had your field full of men that were fighting and the next second your field is empty and everybody is running and screaming like little girls. And these are pretty much the general ideas, the general concepts. The game is not complex when it comes to the core rule. You will still have to do a little bit of homework to get used to all the different units and what they can do because different units will modify some of the rules that I explained earlier. They work in different ways. They interact differently with one another. But if this, of course, is a little bit of extra homework, it can still be done gradually. You can start by playing scenarios that do not have many different different types of units and then you move on to the more complex ones and actually when you start really seeing all that the units can do that is really when the game becomes fascinating, when the game shows its subtleties and also when the game gains its flavor because really it is thanks to all that the units can do and how the units can interact that um, the general Astra model really gets embodied in the experience of the single individual battle. I would I would say that because of the grand tactical uh, um, 
scale of the game, you really get a sense of the organic experience. You really see how the different parts of the army get to work together and they can again, cover for each other's weaknesses or emphasize each other's strengths. This to me is a fascinating experience. And this clearly is a game that has a very strong sense of realism, which was the purpose of the design originally and I think this has been achieved beautifully. Because of this I am enjoying a lot of the historical scenarios and I don't have any desire yet to go for the uh, free deployments. I'm just having so much fun getting to know and to experience these battles they were, the way they went. Even if from the starting, from the setup, uh, the scenario is tilted and one of the two sides may be doomed or almost doomed, I don't care. I don't care about that when I'm playing Solitaire. I don't even mind if I'm playing the Doom side in a face-to-face -face game. Because because I'm still getting such a good sense of how history developed and that to me is the biggest pleasure that comes from historical wargaming and lost battles really is a phenomenal achievement in this. This is a game that I really highly recommend. It is a design that has the complexity of a game in terms of rules and the execution as a complexity of a game but gives you the feel and the experience of a simulation and that to me is simply great. This is again a design that I highly recommend. Sure it's expensive, it may take a while to get used to it but I think it is going to be a great investment, an investment that you are not going to regret.